I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and come with me tonight to the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. I want to beg of you your patience because I'm going to do something untraditional. I'm going to read this context in its entirety. The 13th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he hath grown up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form, no comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he openeth not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by the knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I provide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath pulled out of his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many, made intercession for his transgressions. A profound and prolific text. Tonight, from the context of Isaiah 53, I want to talk to you from the subject, the Via Dolorosa. The Via Dolorosa. Please be seated. I suppose that the most prudent thing would be to very swiftly indicate to you tonight that the designation, the term, the words, the phrase, the verbiage, via dolorosa, cannot be found in the entirety of Old and New Testament canon. But I want to further suggest to you that even the term, the word, the designation, the term, the verbiage, via dolorosa, may not be found in the Old and New Testament canon. If one were to, number one, get a definitional perspective, and number two, if one were to look at the, uh, the historicity of the word, and if number three, if one were to look at the etymology of the word, then we could find a premise by which we could extract the Via Dolorosa from the pages of New Testament inspiration. Now, when I say a definitional perspective, I mean that a subject well defined is already half taught. When I say an etymology, I'm talking about the very origin and the beginning and the inception of the word. And when I talk about the historicity of the word, I'm suggesting to you that the usage and the application of the word consistently finds a place in many cultures among many people as time uh, passes by. When we look at the Via Dolorosa, from a definitional perspective, I would suggest to you that it literally means a way of grief. It means the griefful way. 
As time matriculates, it goes on from the Latin origin to mean the way of sorrow, the way of suffering, to be simply put the painful way. Therefore, tonight, when we talk about the Via Dolorosa, we are talking about the way of grief, the way of sorrow, the way of suffering, or the painful way. Second of all, let me suggest to you that by all probability, the Via Dolorosa may be applied to many men and women throughout history. The truth be told, many of us tonight may have walked our own Via Dolorosa. Perhaps you walked as others have the way of grief, the way of sorrow, the way of suffering, or the painful way. Therefore, I'm not simply looking for the Via Dolorosa in order to understand the biblical premise of the Via Dolorosa. I want to understand the person of the Via Dolorosa. You must concede tonight that many men and women have walked the way of suffering, the way of pain, the way of blood, the way of death, the way of sorrow, the way of grief. Yet I submit to you that when the Son of God, when God incarnate, when God wrapped in a robe of human flesh, when he got down off of this throne of principality and wrapped himself in a robe of human flesh and walked the Via Dolorosa, that it changed the perception of the Via Dolorosa. It changed the premise of the Via Dolorosa. It changed the impact of the Via Dolorosa changed the definition of the Via Dolorosa for in this instance it was not merely a round eyed slope shouldered two legged put his pants on one leg at a time man it was Christ God in the flesh that walked the Via Dolorosa the person of the Via Dolorosa begins to bring definition to the Via Dolorosa. May I quickly suggest to you tonight that there is no better text in all of scripture to talk about the Via Dolorosa than Isaiah chapter 53. Listen to me ladies and gentlemen. There is no other religion nor is there any book on earth that comes in two volumes one book that tells you what's going to happen and the second book that tells you that it happened none other than New Testament Christianity none other than the books that define Christology none other than the books that give us true theology can legitimately tell us what is going to happen and then later on tell us that it in fact happened Isaiah chapter 53 brethren, is not merely a prophecy Isaiah 53 is a prophecy of the gospel that makes it the gospel according to Isaiah in Isaiah 53 do we find the center, the depth, the core, and the heartbeat of all Christology? That is the cross of Jesus Christ. Brethren, at the heart of our conviction, the heart of our belief, the heart of, of, of our hope for eternal glory, all sinners in the cross of Jesus Christ. Isaiah is the most quoted chapter in all of the New Testament Bible. I know that the majority of us are most familiar with Isaiah 53 because of Acts chapter 8 when the Ethiopian eunuch uh, obeyed the gospel after Philip preached from him and took his sermon text from Isaiah 53. But I want you to know that almost every verse in Isaiah 53 is quoted someplace in the New Testament Bible. It is quoted in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, in Acts, in John, in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, in 1 Peter, in 2 Peter, and in Titus, all in part or the whole of some of these 13 verses in Isaiah chapter 53 is recorded and repeated. That makes Isaiah 53 perhaps the most important 
text of scripture in the entirety of the Old Testament and arguably it may well be the most important text of scripture in the entirety of the Bible because it teaches us about the coming of the Via Dolorosa. I want to talk about three things and I'm going to go to my seat tonight. I want to look at the person of the Via Dolorosa. I want to look at the purpose of the Via Dolorosa and then I want to talk about the passion of the Via Dolorosa. Now, some of you right now are sitting there Googling Via Dolorosa. And I want to caution you. I am cognizant of the fact that 1,000 years after Christ, under the Byzantine Empire, that the apostate of all Christianity, the mother church of apostasy, Catholicism, endeavored to go into the old city of Jerusalem and to mark 14 to 15 stations. And all of those 14, 15 stations are supposed to be places that are significant to the old path that he took from Pontius Pilate's judgment seat all the way to Golgotha. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to suggest to you that you are to be careful with the internet and you certainly ought to be careful when you're looking at teachings that derive from apostate Christianity and I'm here to tell you tonight that the Via Dolorosa did not start at the judgment seat or the judgment hall of Pontius Pilate. The Via Dolorosa started in Genesis 3.15. So I want to talk about the person. I need to know who's this person that is to walk the Via Dolorosa and I want to suggest to you that that person is the Messiah and that the Messiah is none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know what? That is a profound prophecy in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. But what I'm going to do brother preacher since you got all up in my lesson I'm not going to charge you for doing that. But since you got all up in it I'm just going to step over on the other side of his point and let me grab something on the other side of his point and then you can use his point my point put it together and you got one point. So let me go back to Genesis chapter 15 and 3 chapter 3 in verse 15 and let me suggest to you ladies and gentlemen that this is the first veiled promise you see God often gives us snapshots in the Old Testament he often gives us snapshots if you step back sometimes that snapshot will turn into a panoramic view so that you can get articulate details and information about that which is to come when you turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 you learn something about the person that would walk the Via Dolorosa. It was the seed of a woman. It's interesting, the following. Number one, Satan used the woman to cause man to fall. God uniquely used the woman to raise man to an unfallen state. He does so by saying to Satan that there's going to be a seed that will bruise your head. But what's interesting is that head bruising seed would come not from a man, but it would come from a woman. Do I need to tell somebody tonight that seeds don't come from women? But the Im implication is that in as much as, as Satan used the woman to cause the fall, God uniquely uses the woman for man's redemption from sin. It would be the seed of a woman. Second of all, here's the Via Dolorosa. He says, you will crush his heel. That's the cross. More importantly, it is death which came on the cross. But Christ, the seed of a woman, bruised, the Hebrew word is literally crushed Satan's head because he conquered death hell and the grave. You see ladies and gentlemen we must ever remember that when Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior got up from the grave he did more than just get up from the grave. He got up declaring that all power and authority is given to me in heaven and in earth and he took the devil's keys. He took his house keys. He took the keys to death, hell and the grave. Therefore he crushed Satan's head. There's your Via Dolorosa. He's to die, but Christ conquers death. And then, will you remember that God is a covenant-making, a promise-making God? 
And if you start walking through the scriptures, you see all of this seed activity that develops. And every time it's talked about, it becomes more definitive and more definitive as the seed starts walking closer and closer to the Via Dolorosa. Genesis 3 and 15, we know that it's going to be the seed of a woman. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, we know that that seed of a woman is certainly going to come by way of a virgin birth. Then we see in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, God promises threefold promise. He promises a people promise, a nation promise, a land promise and a seed promise and by the way I, since I've been here in Fort Lauderdale this weekend I've never in my life heard so much on y'all's television about donating money to fallen Israel and how Christians in Israel need to get together let me tell you something from the time that Israel became disobedient and, and not compliant to God from AD 70 when God destroyed Jerusalem Jerusalem I'm talking about the Jewish people they are a people forever and a nation never they blew their chance they blew their opportunity God shows them through which to bring the seed and the seed nation where people should have become a nation and the nation should have become a kingdom but they failed as a kingdom because they failed as a nation and the greatest blessing that could ever come to us through the Jewish nation was the seed that came from this woman I want to suggest to you tonight that we see the coming of the seed. We learn in Genesis chapter three, uh, 12, verses 1 to 3, that it would come through Father Abraham. Then Abraham had a number of sons. He had children by Sarai. He had children by Hagar. He had children by Keturah. So what son was it supposed to come from? Well, in Genesis chapter 17, verses 19 to 21, when Isaac was to be offered on the altar, but God stopped him from offering Isaac is because the message from God relative to the seed promise is that it would come through this child. It would come through Isaac. Just as his daddy Abraham, Isaac, had a number of children. He had Esau and Jacob. And so God showed up in Genesis chapter 28, verses 13 and 14, and showed that through Isaac's loins, the child, the seed, the virgin seed, would come through Jacob. Genesis chapter 49 and verse number 10. Will you remember tonight? That Jacob had 12 sons. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Isgar, Dan, Nephilim, Gad, Asher, Joseph, Benjamin, Manasseh, Ephraim. Those were 12 tribes. God shows that out of the 12 sons that the royal tribe would be Judah through which the seed would come that would ultimately be the person to walk the Via Dolorosa. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 to 16, that tribe of Judah is chosen through which to bring the lineage of King David and from the divinic bloodline would ultimately come the person for the Via Dolorosa, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He changed the entire definition of the Via Dolorosa. Because now we have God wrapped in human flesh. There are over 2,000 prophecies in the Old Testament Bible. Of those 2,300 of them are Messianic prophecies. Jesus Christ fulfills every one of those 300 prophecies. I heard a mathematician put it like this once. For one person to fulfill eight messianic prophecies would be the equivalent to one out of 100 trillion. For one person to be the fulfillment of 48 messianic prophecies would be the equivalent of 10 to the 157th power. For one person to be the fulfillment of 48, or rather for, uh, to be the fulfillment of 300 messianic prophecies equals Jesus Christ. <laughs> the person of the Via Dolorosa was the son of God. He was the Messiah. And nobody could enjoy the substitutionary sacrifice as offered by the son of God Jesus Christ. Brethren, this blows my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isaiah is a deep dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This thing gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah. 
and deeper. The more you dig in to Isaiah 53, the deeper and deeper and deeper uh, this thing gets. I, I know Doc keeps microphones everywhere. I, I've seen him pull them out of his pocket. I know it's one up here. <laughs> Isaiah's deep. I want to talk about the purpose. God is a God of specificity. God never does something for nothing. He's a God of divine economy. When God does something, stand back and watch. God is doing something. God is up to something. And right in the core, in the heart of Isaiah 53 is the purpose for the Via Dolorosa. Now let me show you how God gets to them. Did you ever notice that the book of Isaiah is laid out much like Scripture? It's made up of two books. 39 in the first book, 27 chapters in the new book. Much like scripture, there are 66 books. 39 in the old, 27 in the new. In the book of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters is about judgment. The last 27 is about salvation. If you look at the last 27 books of salvation, you'll notice that there are three groups of nine. Nine, nine, and nine, which are 27. The first nine, about salvation. The third nine, about salvation. The third nine, about salvation. The first nine, about salvation from Babylonian captivity. The last nine, about salvation from the curse. The middle nine is about salvation from sin. If you look at the middle of the middle and start in Isaiah chapter 52 verse 11 and go all the way through Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 12, you will see that the middle is Isaiah chapter 53 verses 5 and 6. Now I know where the middle of the middle of the middle is because if you start reading this text, there is a prescript, a script, and a postscript. The prescript starts in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 11. Where God speaks in the first person. And God introduces what's going to be said in Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 through 11a. When God gives the introduction in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13. That is the prescript. And then Isaiah chapter 53 verse 1 to 11a is the script. Then in Isaiah chapter 3 verse 11 part 8 to verse 13 God speaks again and he confirms that what was said in the script is true. So in Isaiah chapter 56 verses 5 and 7 we learn the purpose of the Via Dolorosa. Let me tell you what the purpose is. The purpose is he was wounded for our transgression. He was buried for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. That is the purpose of the Via Dolorosa. Man wrote a check that he could not pay. Man committed a sin from which he could not redeem himself. Man had a debt to pay that no human man could pay. And so we needed the right person to walk the Via Dolorosa. And that person was the Messiah. It was God himself. It's interesting to me in Genesis chapter 3, beginning about verse number 7, that the first thing that happened to Adam when he noticed that they had committed sin is that he tried to cover up the shame of his naked with fig leaves. But if you look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 22, you'll find that when God talked to him, what God did was took the skin of an animal and covered the nakedness of Adam's sin even though Adam had already tried to cover the shame of his nakedness and I learned something there about the purpose of the Via Dolorosa you see man cannot cover the shame of his own sin man cannot make atonement of that which he has done wrong in the sight of God you can cover yourself with fig leaves but only the blood of sacrifice only the atoning blood and nobody could make it but God God had to make that decision. I can't help to believe that even though a sound of sacrifice had not yet come, God took the blood of an animal by sacrifice which prefigured the fact that there was going to be a purpose to the Via Dolorosa and that is the sins of man needed to be covered and it could only be covered by blood and the blood had to be covered and sent by God. So I want you to know 
Jesus is on his way to the Via Dolorosa because he is the right sacrifice. Not any sacrifice, but he is the right sacrifice. And so I move to my third point, and that is the passion of Christ. If you read the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the interactive gospel of John, and you read the report uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and then turn around and read the ascension report in Acts chapter 1, beginning verse 7 to 9, here's what you'll find. You'll find that one day, our Savior decided to step down off of the throne of principality and power, wrap himself in a robe of human flesh, showed up in Bethlehem of Judea, wrapped in swaddling clothing, laid in a manger because he's got to walk the Via Dolorosa. You'll find three Magi warriors coming from the east to bring gifts of Mary and St. Frankincense because they know that he's getting ready to walk the Via Dolorosa. They acknowledged him as King of Kings because he's got to walk the Via Dolorosa. One day Jesus showed up in the temple, started befuddling the minds of the doctors. He was on his way to the Via Dolorosa, showed up in Cana of Galilee, turned water into wine because he's on his way to the Via Dolorosa stopped by the receipt of customs. Chose Matthew. He's on his way to the Via Dolorosa. Stopped by the sea coast of Galilee. Had Peter, James, and John shut down their fishing business and follow Jesus. He's on his way up the Via Dolorosa. Caused the blind to see. Caused the lame to walk. He would folk with issues of blood. He's on his way to the Via Dolorosa. Jesus let every man know that he was Messiah in the flesh because he's on his way to the Via Dolorosa. Jesus had power. Jesus had authority. Jesus had the wherewithal to walk away from it all. But it did not because he was walking the Via Dolorosa. Jesus allowed himself to be betrayed by Judas, he allowed himself for the 30 pieces of silver to be the cost of his blood. He allowed them to put him in chains and drag him to the judgment seat. He didn't mind because he was getting ready to walk the Via Dolorosa. And you know what? As I conclude and go to the end of this road, I want you to know that Pilate sure enough told the truth when he said, Behold! thy king in John 19 17 he said behold the king but at the end he said behold thy king he sure was right about it Jesus is not just king he's my king he's not just a sanctifier he's my sanctification he's not just a justifier He's my justification. He's not just a propitiation. He's my propitiation. He's not just a Lord. He's my Lord. He's not just a sacrifice. He's my sacrifice. He's not just a lamb for sinners slain. He's my lamb for sinners slain. And so they led him to the cross where they crucified him. Let me tell you something, brethren. This is why we can meet this week in Fort Lauderdale and arc a case for the cross because our Lord allowed these activities and ultimately Jesus gave up the ghost went down into the Hadean realm but the devil thought he had you ever seen Satan when he thought he had you. You ever seen him when you thought, or he thought that he had you between a rock and a hard place? I said, have you ever seen him when you thought you didn't have no place else to turn, or no place else to go? But I want to tell you something, early on Sunday morning, I said early on Sunday morning, I said early on Sunday morning, Jesus got up from the grave declaring all power. And let me tell you.
y'all some young folk. Y'all young folk think y'all bad. Y'all don't know bad. Y'all don't know bad. Let me tell you something. Before Jesus quit walking the field on the road, he got tired of Satan messing with him. Used his spiritual GPA system. Found out where he lived. Went down to the Hadean realm. Kicked down the front door. Went in. Whooped that devil three days and three nights. And when he got through whooping it, he took his house keys, stepped up on resurrection ground, and said, All power and authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. And I got the keys to death, hell, and the grave. That's a bad boy. It's one thing to get whooped in your own house, but it's another thing to get whooped and somebody take your house keys. That's what happened. Not when man walked the Via Dolorosa, but when the Messiah walked the Via Dolorosa. It put the Via Dolorosa in history. It made that word, it made that term, it made that designation, it made that verbiage take on a new meaning, a new dimension. And now tonight, some of you all are on the Via Dolorosa. Some of you are on the Via Dolorosa because you refuse to obey the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Well, Brother Thompson, I said I was going to go old school, new school. If folks keep talking about you old school. Well, I don't have no problem being old school. I go old school, new school. I can do old school and new school. I can tell you to hear the gospel. Romans 10 and 17, believe it. Yeah, yeah. Hebrews 11 says, repent of your sin. Acts 17 30, confess your belief in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Yeah, yeah. Acts, uh, Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33. Yeah, the confession of Acts 8 and 37. I tell you to be buried in liquid tomb baptism for the remission of your sins. Yeah. But let me go new school. Right, new school you need to hear the gospel because you ain't smart enough to do what you don't know. <laughs> Romans 10 and 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. You need to believe the gospel because you don't learn to stand for something. You're going to fall for anything. Yeah. Hebrews 11 and 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. That he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Then you need to repent. You, you need to confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart. I, I'm sorry, you need to repent of your past sins. Let me tell you why you need to repent. Listen to me. If you keep doing what you always did, you're just going to get what you always got. So you need to repent of sin. Acts 17, 30, the time of this ignorance, God went but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Then you need to be buried in the liquid tomb of baptism. That's an immersion in water and that for the remission of your past sins. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Then you confess your belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Greatest confession I ever made. All of the junk stuff and foolish and ignorance that I've been through in my life, I was happy to confess that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I came up in a home where my father would smack the taste out of your mouth if you said the name Jesus in his house. I was grateful for the day I walked down those aisles and said, yes, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And based on that confession, I was immersed in water for the remission of my past sins. And Christ added me to the church of Christ. I said, he added me to the church of Christ. Y'all don't hear me. Maybe I need to get out. I, I am a little short. Maybe I need. I said he added me to the church of Christ. Yes, yes, Amen. I decided a long time ago, I'm going to quit arguing with folk about that. The church of Christ is in the Bible. I'm not going to argue with that. You got a problem with it being named church of Christ? I'm not going to argue with that about that. Everything at your little raggedy house got your name on it. The mortgage got your name on it. Them little no-neck monsters got your name. Your wife got your name. Your credit cards got your name. Everything you own got your name on it. And the church that he owns has his name. And then you work out your soul's salvation. Be faithful to God even if death confronts you. And you know what? The Lord has got it covered. You know why? He walked the Via Dolorosa. That's my lesson tonight. You've got a definition of perspective. The etymology. The historicity of it. You know the person. The purpose. And you know about the passion. Now, we can build a case for the cross because Christ walked the Via Dolorosa. As together we stand, together we sing.
Jesus.